Okay, welcome. This is our first video lecture. I'm going to be doing an overview of uh, uh, chapter one, which is just kind of a general introduction to the course and astronomy in general. And we're going to go over uh, different concepts of scale, uh, units, numbers, and how we work with all those things. Um, the challenge we have in astronomy is that we deal with things that are outside of the Earth, and that generally involves things that are quite large. Um, very long ideas of distance, very long ideas of time, and a lot of these things really allow, lie outside of the common human experience. And because of that, it's very difficult to relate to some of these things. Um, you know, I'll give you a good example of this. I was watching a movie with my kids. Um, uh, a few years ago, and there was a scene where a, a dad and a son were sitting on the lawn and looking up at the stars, and the son says, wow, dad, how far away do you think those stars are? And the dad says, oh, son, those are billions of miles away. And, you know, I thought about that for a second, so that doesn't make any sense. Billions of miles away is where Saturn's located. And, uh, you know, when they wrote that, I'm sure they thought that billions was really big, and it indicated things were very far away, but... Um, you kind of get lost in the numbers. Numbers just all sound big, and so it's very difficult to sort of comprehend these things. In reality, the nearest stars are tens of trillions of miles away, which is you know, many orders of magnitude farther away. Uh, by the way, that term I'm using, order of magnitude, is a term you'll hear me commonly use in this class, and that generally means a by a factor of 10. So if I say something is an order of magnitude larger than some other thing, then it's 10 times bigger than another thing. That's what I mean by that. So one of the uh, ideas that I'm going to try to introduce and discuss in this first lecture is this concept of relative magnitude, where we can sort of wrap our heads around these really enormous distances and time scales and relate them to things that are more common. And when you have scale factors, you can do that. It's like when you look at a map, and a map says that an inch is 100 miles. Okay, They're scaling down. Uh, things so that it becomes easier to comprehend and everything is, is to, c to correct scale. That's the idea. So that's what we're going to do uh, in this lecture. And the way I'm going to go about it is I'm going to um, start in on the Earth here and we're going to zoom outwards. And each time we zoom outwards, we're going to increase our scale factor. Okay. So I'm going to start with something that is approximately the size of a classroom. And I've somewhat arbitrarily chosen 52 by 52 feet. I didn't have to choose that. Um, you'll see why I choose that a little bit later. But, um, you know, a classroom is 52 by 52 feet to an order of magnitude, meaning no classroom is 5 by 5 feet, for example. No classroom is 500 by 500 feet. Uh, tens of feet describe pretty much the dimensions of a classroom. So I'm going to start with that. Um, and you'll notice that I use the unit of feet for this. Um, I have a couple reasons for doing that. One of the reasons for doing that is that feet are going to be more familiar to you. You can easily comprehend what a foot is and probably what 10 feet is. And so 52 feet is not too difficult to, to understand. I could use other units. Um, we're going to introduce the metric system later on. I didn't use metric now because most people, at least in America, don't really understand how big a meter is, so it's difficult to comprehend that distance. I also didn't choose something like inches. Uh, inches are not appropriate for this type of scale because inches usually measure things that are much smaller than a classroom. So if I were to mention that the scale of the classroom is 700 inches, you would be confused. Why are you using that number? You know, that's strange. So um, the number becomes smaller and easier to comprehend. The unit is familiar to you. You can sort of imagine how big that is. As we do these jumps, I'm going to uh, try to use units that accomplish both of those things, make the numbers small and easily comprehensible, and also to provide a context. Uh, you know, when you say feet, you sort of know what that means. Uh, of course, as we get larger and larger, that might be unavoidable. The numbers just might be naturally large, and there's really nothing you can do about that. Uh, so I'm going to do these repeated jumps, basically. And every time I do a jump, we're going to increase our scale factor by two orders of magnitude, or two powers of 10. That's a factor of 100 in linear scale. That means, in terms of across a classroom, 
it goes up by a factor of 100. So in terms of like an area, we're actually increasing by a factor of 100 times 100. Okay, but I'm going to be always talk about in terms of linear scale. So the distance across from wall to wall in a classroom is about 52 feet. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to keep track of all these jumps uh, so we can relate it back to things um, when we get to it. All right, so I'm going to do my first jump right now. And when we do our first jump, we go from 52 by 52 feet. Now we're at 5,200 feet by 5,200 feet. So we've zoomed out quite a bit. And when you do that, you get a big chunk of the city. And you can see in the picture on the left here, that's where ABC is located. It's in the bottom right. And in this particular picture, we have Avenue K on the bottom and J is on top and 30th is on the right and 40th West is on the left hand side. It's a big city block. Um, it's 52 feet, 5,200 feet by 5,200 feet. I'm going to change that unit right now because it's starting to get a little awkward to describe things in feet at this point because you know this might be distances you would use to describe you know how far away your friend's house is or how far away the nearby store is and it'd be very strange if you just told somebody that oh yeah my friend lives 8,000 feet away You'd be like, you know what are you what are you what are you saying here uh, so I'm gonna change the unit to the mile you're still familiar with what miles are it makes the numbers smaller and more manageable to work with uh, so I'm gonna choose miles at least for now uh, very soon though however um, you know, we're going to get to very large numbers of miles and it really won't matter if I use miles or any other units. So what we're going to do, uh, what I'm just going to do right now is I'm going to change our system of units to what is standard in the sciences. And in the sciences, like most of the rest of the world, we use the metric system of units. Uh, the metric system has some benefits to it. Uh, for example, if you're describing lengths or distances there is a standard unit to use and that is the meter if you want to express larger or smaller units of distance you don't have to completely change the unit like we have in the English system you simply use what we call a prefix it's a prefix system you attach something to the front of the name to indicate magnitude so for example if you want to talk about thousands of meters we call it a kilometer uh, the kilo is the prefix that represents a thousand. Um, you can see there's some other prefixes here. Mega is for a million. Giga is for a billion. There's actually prefixes for every order of magnitude, but the three that you see here are the ones that we use the most. You'll see it the most often, so I really want you to know what those things mean. Uh, you see on the bottom there, as an example, if I wanted to say five million seconds, I could say five megaseconds. Um, to express that, that's uh, granted it is a little strange to say that, we would probably want to express that in say maybe weeks or months. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to be strictly metric here. I would never really say 5 million seconds for something. I would express it, like I said, in weeks or months. So our units are always going to be rooted in metric. They may not be strictly metric, but they will, they're will. they going to be based in metric. Um, so like for example, say in the year, the year is based in the second. So um, you can that's that's a number that's rooted in the metric system so um we're going to be sticking with metric system for now so as we do our next jump here i uh, have the miles we're now 100 miles by 100 miles but that happens to also be 160 kilometers across so uh, our next jump here took us to a very significant chunk of southern california um, Victor Valley is on the right hand side. We're almost to Santa Barbara on the left hand side. Downtown LA is in the bottom. Bakersfield's in the upper left. So 100 miles in linear scale. Uh, we are four orders of magnitude larger than the classroom now. So that's a scale factor of 10,000. And that will be something to remember because if I were to describe something later on in the class as being four orders magnitude larger, it would be like comparing classroom to Southern California. That would be a, um, a significant uh, comparison to make because they would be to scale. Okay. Now you see I have listed both the miles and the kilometers here. Um, we're ditching miles now. We're sticking with kilometers. Uh, however, there's going to be a lot of situations where units can be used somewhat interchangeably like miles and kilometers, even though I want to use kilometers to be metric. So there will be times that you will see unit conversions. And at least for the purposes of this class, I'm not too concerned with you being able to do unit conversions you know, mathematically. 
but I want you to understand what they mean when you see them. So for example here, uh, a one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. That is the conversion factor when you want to you know, transfer your number between miles and kilometers. Um, but I, like I said, I want you to understand what it means when you see these things. Um, so think about this question for a minute here. What unit is a longer measure of distance here? So think about that for a minute. You may want to pause your video. But the answer here is going to be a mile. So when you look at the conversion factor, a lot of people make the mistake of seeing a larger number on the kilometers and thinking, oh, okay, well, that must be a longer unit of measure. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, a mile requires a full kilometer plus an additional 0.6 of a kilometer. So therefore, the mile is actually measuring a greater amount of distance. Uh, the same thing is going to apply when we talk about distances to stars. The um, uh, nearest stars can be specified in light years or they can be specified in parsecs. And they're very similar units. They have different contexts, and we have different reasons why we want to use them, but they have a very similar distance measure to them. Uh, a parsec is 3.3 light years approximately. So in that context, the parsec actually is a longer unit of measure. So uh, like I said, when you see these things, I want you to understand them. So when you see the conversion factor here, um, a single mile is multiple kilometers. Therefore, a mile is a longer measure of distance. All right, so we're going to do it ready for our next jump here. Remember, we went from classroom to city block to Southern California. So the next jump, you know, you might think, okay, it's going to be all of California, uh, maybe the Western United States or something like that. But surprisingly, when we do our next jump, we actually jump completely outside of the Earth here. And that just demonstrates the... Um, the magnitude of these jumps. Uh, the, the, we're basically doing exponential jumps here. Um, every time we jump, we are 100 times larger in linear scale than the previous one, which was already 100 times larger than the one before it. So these jumps are actually quite significant here. So we went from 160 kilometers. Now we jumped all the way up to 16,000 kilometers. And that exceeds the diameter of the Earth, which is around you know, 12,800 kilometers. We are six orders of magnitude larger than the classroom. So on the bottom right there, you see the orders of magnitude and the scale factor. I'm always referencing back to how big the classroom is. And again, if I describe something as being a million times larger than something else, it's like the comparison of classroom to Earth. So again, we can scale things down and imagine what they're like if they're on the Earth. And that's sort of the, one of the reasons we're doing the scaling idea here. Okay, you also no, no, uh, notice that at the bottom of uh, the picture of the Earth here, I have the number 16,000 uh, stated in a slightly different format, 1.6 times 10 to the fourth. That number is in scientific notation. That is something that you are going to encounter um, quite frequently in this class, actually, for numbers that are very large and very small. Um, sometimes it's unavoidable to have really large or really small numbers. And so we have a system that simplifies expressing those numbers. And since you will see it so often, I want to make sure you really understand what you're looking at when you read these things. So let's go over that a little bit. Scientific notation is simply a convenient way to write these really big or really small numbers. And the reason is that the numbers in a place value system like we have here um, really serve two purposes. Um, like in the number 45,600, uh, that number, um, the 4, the 5, and the 6, those numbers are there for value. They tell you what the value of the number is. But the zeros on the back, they're not necessarily for value. They could be for value, but the number could have been rounded, for example. And the zeros are simply there to indicate magnitude, to let you know that the number is in the tens of thousands. And if your number is extremely large, like in the billions or trillions, you'll have a lot of zeros on there, which is a little cumbersome to write. So uh, what we can do is we can write this in terms of a decimal times a power of 10, and that eliminates the need for all these extra zeros. For example, 45,600 can be written as 4.56 times 10 to the fourth. So let me explain how we got that. The implied decimal point in the number 45,600 is, of course, at the very end behind the zeros. In order to write it in scientific notation, we have to move the decimal point over to the left so that it is between the first two numbers. That's the 4 and the 5. 
we had to move the decimal point four places over to the left. So we move that four places over to the left. We discard the placeholder zeros. The number becomes 4.56. And our power of 10 is, has an index on it that indicates how much the decimal point moved. It moved four to the left, therefore it's 10 to the four. The same way works with numbers that are smaller than one. Uh, for numbers that are smaller than one, of course, you have to shift the decimal point to the right, and that would give you a negative index indicating a very small number. So in the number that we have in the second example here, we had to move the decimal point over five places to the right to stick it between the first two significant numbers, the five and the eight. So now the number is 5.81. We've discarded all the placeholder zeros times 10 to the minus 5 because we moved the decimal point 5 to the right. Okay, so that's how we write our numbers in scientific notation. Um, again, you're going to see these numbers a lot. It's very important that you understand what you are reading when you read these numbers. And so what I've listed here are some very common powers of 10 that translate to their names. And you want to be familiar with these. 10 to the 3 is 1,000. 10 to the 6 is a million. 10 to the 9 is a billion. If you're somewhere in between these things, you can attach the 10 or 100 that you normally would. So, for example, 10 to the 7 would be 10 million. Okay. So I want to go over a couple questions to make sure you understand this. Again, you can always pause the video to ponder the answer to these questions before I actually reveal it. But uh, 5.01 times 10 to the 5 is the, ex uh, we want to know what the expanded form of that is. So before it was written in scientific notation. So think about that for a moment. The answer here is C. Okay, so 10 to the 5th is th 2 up from, from uh, 10 to the 3, which is 1,000. So this is 100,000. This would be 501,000 is the number that we're looking for here. For this next question, uh, the number we have here is 2.96 times 10 to the 8. So again, you want to look at 10 to the 8 and try to determine what kind of magnitude that is. Uh, the answer here is going to be B, 100 million. So you would say 296 million if you wanted to say the number. Okay, of course, you're going to read numbers like this, so you would read it as 296 million. Okay, good. All right, next jump. Um, we have expanded another two orders of magnitude. We were 1.6 times 10 to the 4. One of the nice things about these jumps that we're doing is because they're two orders of magnitude, all you have to do is increment the index by 2. So we are now at 1.6 times 10 to the 6, so 1.6 million kilometers. When we make that jump, we can now fit the Earth-Moon orbit into this picture here. And, uh, you know, when you look at this picture, it certainly gives the impression that the moon is somewhat close to the Earth because it only required one jump to see the moon when, once we saw the entire Earth. Again, if you take this back, it's like comparing the classroom to the city block. If we look at the classroom and then we did a jump, uh, that means the moon would fit in the city block. The classroom's the Earth. We zoom out, and the moon could be somewhere found among the city blocks. So... It really does give you the impression that things are close, but let's think about these numbers a bit more here. Now, the way this works is the picture on the right is a hundredth in terms of uh, linear distance uh, compared to the one on the left. So, in other words, you could line up a hundred Earths from left to right on the picture on the left-hand side. So, the Earth is right in the middle there, and if you try to estimate to where the moon is, well, from the center out to the far right edge would be 50 Earths. And if you look at where the moon is, it's kind of in the middle. So let's estimate it to be about maybe 25 Earth diameters out to the moon. Well, 25 Earth diameters. Well, how, how big of a distance is that? Well, if you think about this in terms of circumference, circumference is pi times diameter. Pi is, you know, around three or so. Uh, it's a little more than three, obviously. So it would be like, you know, take 25 divided by three, you get something that's between eight and nine. So it's like going around the earth eight or nine times. Eight or nine times around the earth is approximately the distance uh, out to where the moon is located. And uh, actually, it's very close to that number. And when you think about it like that, uh, then it really does demonstrate that the moon is not really that close in terms of human scale. I mean, if you ever had the unfortunate 
opportunity to fly overseas, especially if you go to like these really far away places like Australia, these 16 hour flights, it's, and that's not even around the earth once it's very long. Of course, you know, planes fly slow compared to a spacecraft or something, but um, it is, it's, it is a big dif- distance for humans. Now I will say, and you'll see this later on the class that uh, as far as other moons are concerned, the moon is very tightly bound to the earth. It's very close to the earth. And it's actually one of the reasons why we were able to hold on to the moon. If you look at some of the other inner planets, they either don't have moons or they have, you know, like Mars, for example, has a couple small captured asteroids. Um, And so the only significant moon in the inner solar system is the Earth's moon because the moon is very big and very close to the Earth. And that's one of the reasons we've been able to hold on to it. Okay, so anyway... In this picture here um, gives us a good sense of how far away the moon is. So if the Earth was the classroom, moon is somewhere in the city block. All right. Now, I'm not going to do a jump quite yet here. I just want to make a comparison. Uh, it turns out that the picture on the left that shows the Earth moon is very similar in scale to the size of the sun. Uh, the, the diameter of the sun is 1.4 million kilometers. Our scale factor was 1.6. So you can kind of interchange these pictures to represent this particular scale. Uh, also, this kind of shows you how big the sun is. You can, if you were to, to put the Earth at the center of the sun, the moon only goes out maybe, you know, maybe two thirds of the solar radius. So the sun is absurdly large compared to human standards, Earth moon standards, things like that. And in fact, what we're going to do is as we zoom out, we're going to start focusing on the sun as opposed to focusing on the Earth. So let's go ahead and do that next jump here. All right, the next jump uh, shows us the inner solar system. So we're another two orders of magnitude larger. We're 1.6 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. Now that number is starting to get too big. Um, Kilometers were appropriate to describe, you know, distances across town and it's still even though the numbers get very big the kilometer is still appropriate to describe the size of objects to describe how far away a moon is from a planet so there's a a pretty broad range of magnitudes that kilometers can be used in but now we're getting to a point where kilometers are no longer appropriate to use so what we did when we did our jump is we zoomed out and we offset so that we're going to be focused on the sun so we offset just so we can fit the earth and the sun in the same particular picture here. Uh, We're changing the unit now. We don't want to use kilometers anymore. We are going to use a new unit, and that is called the astronomical unit. Uh, The abbreviation for the astronomical unit is the AU. It represents the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is around 150 million kilometers. It's not precisely one AU. Uh, Sorry, it's not precisely 150 million kilometers. Uh, In the wintertime, we get winter time in the northern hemisphere I should say we are a little bit closer maybe one uh, million kilometers closer in the summertime we're a tad farther away another one million or so but on average it's about 150 million and so uh, we are going to use this as a unit now which actually has a couple really great benefits to it Um, when you hear this unit the AU uh, that automatically puts you in the correct context every time you hear the AU you where you know that we're talking about things that are in the solar system. Okay, we're not talking about distances to other stars. We're not talking about distances to galaxies. We're in a solar system. So uh, the unit provides a context. If I describe an object as being 40 AU away, you know I'm describing a solar system object, for example. And of course, just like I demonstrated earlier, the numbers that we use become very small and manageable, easy to work with. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is simply one. 1 AU. Okay, you see Mercury and Venus in this picture here. Mercury is at a distance of around 0.4 AU. Venus is 0.7 AU. So uh, you could say that Venus is about 70% the distance that the Earth-Sun distance is. Uh, not in the picture is Mars, about 1.5 AU. Jupiter is about 5.2 AU away. So again, for perspective there, the distance to Jupiter is a little more than five times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that becomes really helpful when we start thinking about things in the solar system. It becomes very easy to sort of do numbers in your head and to think about some of the concepts we're going to talk about. Um, For example, we look out at Jupiter. uh, Let's just say it's 5 AU away. It's a little more than that. Um, 
the um, amount of time it takes light to travel in the solar system. As you might know, it takes about eight minutes for light to travel between the Earth and the Sun. Um, because Jupiter is uh, 5 AU away or so, it's, uh, that distance is actually becomes uh, 40 minutes now. You would simply take that 5 AU, multiply by 8, you get about 40 minutes for light to travel out to Jupiter. Uh, another thing you're going to learn later is the brightness law. Not only is um, the sun fainter out at Jupiter because Jupiter's farther away, but the amount that light diminishes goes by what we call an inverse square law. So you take the distance and you square it, and that's how much fainter something is. So 5 squared is 25. And that means light at Jupiter is 25 times fainter than it is at Earth. So using this AU makes the numbers so much easier to think about and work with. I mean, how could you figure those other things out that I just mentioned if I told you that Jupiter was 750 million kilometers away? I mean, you, you wouldn't even bother to try to figure that out. But when you make the numbers manageable, things become easier. And so we're going to do this throughout these different scales. We're going to change our units for context and for convenience to make things easier to think about. Okay. Well, let's do our next jump here. The next jump takes us outside of the inner solar system, and now we're looking at what we would call the solar system proper. Uh, this is all the significant aspects of the solar system. We're 100 AU across, which means we're actually looking at things that are within about 50 AU from the sun, because 50 would be from the center out to the edge. Um, and you can fit all these significant aspects of the solar system. All the planets fit in uh, 50 AU and uh, on the outer edges of the picture would be something that we call the Kuiper Belt, which is something that is uh, where we're beginning to explore a lot more. If you've heard of the New Horizons spacecraft that explored Pluto a few years ago, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft is out in the Kuiper Belt looking at other objects as well. And so now we won't go from 1 AU to 100 AU. So one thing you want to remember is all the significant parts of our solar system are within 50 AU. Um, so in this picture here, the inner solar system is very tiny now. It's very difficult to see. Uh, but you can see all the planets out to, uh, to, uh, to Neptune here. And um, so uh, just to give you a sense of comparison here, we did two jumps from the sun to inner solar system to outer solar system. So if you wanted to scale down the solar system to comprehend uh, how big it might be, if the sun were to be the classroom, then the inner solar system fits in the city block. That was the next jump we did. And the uh, outer solar system would fit very nicely in Southern California. So if we scale down the solar system, it becomes a little bit easier to think about. Okay, so let's jump again. <coughs> now, jumping again takes us now to 10,000 AU. And the picture on the left here is showing nothing because there is basically nothing. Uh, when you get to thousands of AU from the sun. So if you remember when we do in our comparisons, this, this, these jumps that we just did, what happened when we went outside of Southern California? We saw the entire Earth. And so if we did a similar comparison here, the solar system fits nicely in Southern California, and there is, for most of the rest of the Earth, there's basically nothing. Uh, there are no stars uh, in this picture on the left here. Uh, are there things out here? This would be considered the very outer solar system, something that we call the inner Oort cloud. And we'll talk more about these things when we get into solar system stuff later in the class. Um, it's not that there's nothing out here. It's more like we don't know much about what's out here. If you think about this 10,000 number here and the inverse square law, if you square 10,000, which is 10 to the fourth, you get 10 to the eighth. That's 100 million. And what that means is light out here is faint. It's 100 million times fainter than you would get compared to light at the Earth. And the challenge is, is out here, if there's objects out here, they do not produce their own light. They have to reflect light. So the light has to make it out there, reflect off the object, and come back to the Earth. So it is extremely challenging to see objects out here. In fact, I'll again talk about this later in the class, but we believe there is a ninth planet located in the upper hundreds of AU. Um, but it's very difficult to find. We've been looking for this for a few years now, and we think it will have to look for another maybe 15 more years 
to find this object. And uh, the challenge is it's a needle in a haystack problem. It's, 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 it would barely emit any light, uh, or sorry, reflect any light. And so we have to take very careful pictures of the entire outer solar system uh, uh, near, the, near the plane of the solar system to find this object. And that's just, it's just going to take a long time to do that. There's definitely things out here. A lot of very icy, rocky, what are eff effectively comets that have just yet to come to the inner solar system. So it's not like there's nothing out here. There's, there's definitely a lot of stuff out here. There's potentially new planets out here and uh, a lot of icy asteroids, um, some of which may be kind of large, actually. Uh, and as technology improves and our ability to search out here improves, telescopes improve, and so on, we'll find more and more things out here. It's just a, it's more of a technological issue. So anyway, um, let's jump again and see if we can see some stars. So we're going to jump again, and we're now at a million AU across. And those other dots you see there, they are stars. So we're beginning to see some other stars here. And one of the things that hopefully you get from seeing this picture here is that uh, stars are far away. Uh, compared to the size of the sun, uh, stars are significantly far away. If, in fact, if you think back to our jumps that we did, and let's go ahead and go back and look at these jumps that we did. We went from the sun to the inner solar system. So that's two orders of magnitude. Then we have the outer solar system. That's four orders of magnitude. Then we had this inner Oort cloud, so to speak, uh, which is six orders of magnitude. And then this picture would be eight, but there are some stars that are somewhere close to the sun here. So let's just say it's seven orders of magnitude. That is a factor of 10 million. So if you wanted to properly express the size of a star to distances to other stars, you would have to select an object that is 10 million times smaller than the distance between other objects. Um, and so that is, that is enormous. Uh, stars are incredibly small with respect to their separation distances. Uh, there are reasons for this. We'll get into it when we talk about star formation. Basically, stars will start off as these gigantic clouds in space, and gravity shrinks them down significantly to become a star. And that's sort of why we have these enormous distances between stars. Anyway, let's think about this nearby star, though, and get a sense of how close that is. Now, we're at a million AU. That's too big now. Uh, we don't want to use AU. We're outside the solar system here. And the number's too big, and AU is not the appropriate context, so we're going to change the unit right now. And the new unit that we are going to use is called the light year. It is defined as the distance traveled by light in one year, which we actually can calculate. If you look at the, um, the calculation I have here, the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 5. That's 300,000 kilometers per second. So we want to figure out what that distance would be in a year. So we would need to multiply the number by the number of seconds in a year. And that's 3.15 times 10 to the 7. Just to be clear, in order to get that number, you would have to figure out how many seconds there are in a year, which you would take 60 times 60 times 24 times 365. The first 60 is to convert to minutes. The next 60 is for hours. The 24 is to convert to days. The 365 is to put you into years. So around 31 and a half million uh, seconds in a year. So when you multiply those two numbers together, you get the number that I have in the bottom here, which is a tad under 10 trillion. 10 to the 12 is trillion. So the light year is a very, very big distance, 10 trillion kilometers away. And uh, now I did a bunch of conversions that you're not seeing in the slide. And again, I'm not worried about you doing unit conversions in this class. Uh, but if you convert the 1 million AU uh, based on the numbers that we have here, that converts to 16 light years. So that's what we're looking at in the picture here. Um, from the center of the picture out to the edge would be about 8 light years. And you can fit a significant number of stars. Not quite, a, not quite 100, but a little under 100 stars fit within 8 light years. And actually, the technically closest star to us is the, uh, is the triple star system Alpha Centauri. That is around 4.2 light years away. It's a triple star system. It contains Alpha Centauri, which is almost a complete clone of our sun. It almost has the exact same size and temperature and brightness uh, compared to our sun. Brightness in terms of natural brightness. Um, 
and it's actually composed of two other smaller stars. Um, so it's a triple star system, actually. And that is the closest thing that we are aware of that is not a part of our solar system, 4.2 light years away. Now, let me explain something about this light year unit because we're, we're choosing this light year unit for two reasons. Uh, the numbers are now smaller and easier to work with. Okay, so the, the closest star is 4.2. That's better than saying something in the millions. But there's a context here that's very important, and the context is, the context is what we call look-back time. When we look at Alpha Centauri, we are not seeing Alpha Centauri as it exists right now. If you wanted to go outside tonight and look at Alpha Centauri, well, first of all, you wouldn't see it, assuming you're listening to this in the Antelope Valley. Uh, the Alpha Centauri star system is not visible from the northern hemisphere. You have to go to the southern hemisphere, but let's say you do. It is visible with the naked eye, though, if you're in the southern hemisphere. But the light that enters your eye tonight um, was not emitted tonight. It was actually emitted 4.2 years ago, which means if you're watching this video in the fall of uh, 2019, that means we're talking about probably spring or early summer of 2015. And that's when the light was actually emitted. And it's taken 4.2 years to get to us. And so it can enter your eye and so you can see the object. And that raises some important questions because if you're not seeing the object as it exists right now, one fair question to ask is, you know, has it changed? Is it different? Well, then you have to think about what four years is to a star. Now, I mentioned that Alpha Centauri is almost like an entire clone of our sun. And as you may or may not know, our sun is expected to live for nine to 10 billion years. What's four years in nine to 10 billion years? Well, it's not much. If you want to compare this to a a human's lifespan, which is around, let's just say 100 years just to make this easy to work with, if you actually do the numbers, it's like not even a tenth of a second. So it's like an instant in time for a star. So Alpha Centauri is pretty much the same uh, tonight as it was four years ago. There's really no change. Now, this will be different, though, when we start talking about galaxies, for example, because the closest galaxy to us is around 4.5 million light years away. That's the Andromeda Galaxy. Well, millions of light years, you know, if you want to relate that back to a human scale, that's significant. That could be weeks of time, actually. And that's that. That's a little bit, I mean, if I looked at you, you know, a few weeks ago, you might be a little bit different. You know, your hair might be different. You, might, you know, if you're a man, you may have some you know, stubble if you didn't shave or something like that. So there are some small changes that happen uh, to people over weeks. Now, there are some galaxies that are billions of light years away. And that would be like looking at you when you were a child. And there's significant differences. The galaxies are totally different than they are today, which is good and bad. Uh, it's good because we can actually see what things were like in the past. Uh, it's, it's bad because we don't have a lot of examples of how things exist today. So it's a trade-off, basically. You know, That's one thing that's really special about astronomy. We can boast this idea that we can see things as they were in the past and it's not an artifact or a fossil or anything it's the actual light from these things and so we can skip pictures of literally what they looked like in the past and we can and based on look back time we can look at different distances and therefore see different instances in time we can kind of see a timeline of how galaxies have evolved over time by looking at different distances so that's pretty amazing when you think about it like that but that's the idea of look back time, and I'll mention this quite a bit. But it's something to really think about when we talk about distances, is that things are in the past. You know, you see things in the past. So, All right, so light year is what we're using right now. It's appropriate for talking about distances to stars. If you hear the light year, you should think about, okay, nearby stars. That's what we're talking about. All right, let's jump again. All right, so I'm going to ask you a scaling question now uh, because I – you know, I'm talking a lot about how far away these things might be, and we want to relate it to stuff. And I've kind of hinted at this earlier, but why don't you think about this question here? What this question says basically is we're going to make the sun the size of a basketball. Let's say a basketball is about a foot across. And uh, let's say you take a basketball and you walk outside, and I want you to go where you think Alpha Centauri would be located if the size and distances are to scale. So think about this question for a minute. The answer here is D. Okay. Now, I don't want you to say D because I've just been going on about how far away these stars are. You know, you don't want to say D for that reason. You want to actually think about the numbers here. 
So if you remember a little earlier in the video, I mentioned that the approximate distance between the nearest stars and the size of the stars is around a factor of 10 million. So if the sun's a basketball and the basketball's about a foot, then Alpha Centauri would be about 10 million feet away. Now you have to think about, well, what's 10 million feet away? Well, uh, you know, a mile is around uh, 5,280 feet. So 10 uh, million miles, sorry, 10 million feet might be probably thousands of miles, maybe in the 10,000 miles, something like that. And um, that would probably be somewhere on Earth if the number was in the lower tens of thousands that might be on the other side of the world. So uh, in terms of the scaling question, uh, the, cla the basketballs of, you know, the sun and uh, the solar system fits very easily in probably the Antelope Valley, actually. And then there's nothing outside the Antelope Valley um, until you get to the other side of the world and maybe you have one other star. Um, this is, by the way, one of the reasons why we have yet to travel to other stars. The distances are very big, and if you get on a, you get on a spacecraft, even at the fastest speeds that we can send spacecraft, uh, you probably will not get there in your lifetime. Or if you do, it would be tens of years later. And that provides a very big challenge for us, and I'll talk about that at kind of near the end of the course. We talk about aliens and extraterrestrial uh, um, existence and space travel, and are we going to do it? Have they done it? Things like that, and we'll talk about these ideas. All right, let's keep going. Uh, we're going to jump again. Uh, we're 16 light years across. Now we're 1,600 light years across. And we refer to this as the extended solar neighborhood. This would be about maybe 2% of our galaxy in terms of linear scale. The galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. This is like looking at a big chunk of a city, but you don't really get a sense of what the entire city is like. It's kind of like the city block picture that we saw before. Uh, there's a lot of stars. There'd be millions of stars probably in this, dis in this distance here. Uh, but no galactic structure that we can really see. Light year is still appropriate for this uh, scale, actually. Well, let's just jump again. Uh, if we jump again, we can actually start to see our galaxy. Uh, we are now uh, 160,000 light years across. And, um, you know, you could still use light years for this. Uh, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. That's a that's a approximate number. It kind of depends on what you want to define as the size of the galaxy because the galaxy doesn't have a, an, a, a true edge to it. It's not a rigid object like a desk or something like that where you can easily measure distances. Uh, as you get out near the edge, there's just less and less stars, and, but at some point you kind of have to define what that is. And we usually put that in the range of 100 to maybe 200,000. I, I typically like to say 100,000 for all the significant parts of our galaxy. But uh, anyway, the picture on the left can easily fit that. And um, you notice at the bottom here, I have different units. Uh, while light years are still appropriate, uh, we sometimes use uh, the parsecs for this. And I haven't really defined parsec yet, and I'm not going to until we get a little bit later in the class. Parsecs are usually used when we want to define distances. Um, in fact, one of the ways we measure distances of stars is with the parsec. So for now, just know it's a unit for uh, nearby stars, and actually it's also a unit for galaxies as well. Uh, but anyway, to convert this, uh, you would divide the uh, 160 thousand light years by uh, about 3.3 .3 or so and that's how you get 50 thousand parsecs and if I'm going to use the metric system prefixes it would be 50 kiloparsecs and kiloparsec is a unit you might see it's not that as common but um, the kiloparsec is usually uh, a distance we use to measure significant distances within a galaxy so like for example the distance from us to the center of the galaxy where a supermassive black hole exists would be uh, kiloparsecs. You would say that kiloparsecs, or the length of a spiral arm or something like that might be using kiloparsecs here. So uh, now, the picture to the left here, just to be clear about what you're looking at here, is a picture of a galaxy. It's obviously not our own galaxy. We cannot take a picture of our own galaxy. It would require us to be outside of our galaxy, which, as you're seeing with all the scale here, it would be impossible for us to do. We cannot be outside of ourselves to take that picture. So that's just some random galaxy, but we kind of look a little like that probably. And, um, but you realize the picture that you're looking at, you're looking at stars and what we call dust and gas, the interstellar medium. And most of what you see in the picture is actually the dust and gas, the nebula, 
uh, the, the stars are pinpoints of light, and they're they're very small. If you do the scaling numbers here, uh, the size of a star compared to the size of a galaxy is something absurd, like a factor of a trillion or something. You know, stars are a trillion times smaller, approximately, than than their respective galaxies. So, um, of course, stars emit light. And that's a big part of what a galaxy is. But a lot of the structure is actually defined by nebula, and not stars itself. Now, I, I actually want to do a scaling thing here. Again, this is not something that I'm going to require you to do. It's just a interesting little calculation that gives you a sense of how big the galaxy is. So, uh, what if we were to scale down the Milky Way, which is 100,000 light years across, so that it's the size of the continental United States, which is approximately 3,000 miles across? So, if we did that, what would other things become, basically? Well, you would have to divide the two numbers there. If you divide 100,000 light years, by 3,000 miles, you get that a light year is about three hundredths of a mile, which is around 160 feet. All right. So um, let's just say you are at the center of of this of this uh, comparison here. Uh, the nearest star would be about 690 feet away from you. That's how close. That's how far away the nearest star would be. The solar system would be. Uh, which if I'm going to say 100 AU is just three inches, which is probably the size of your pinky. Most people's pinky is about three inches or so. And that's how big the solar system is. Uh, and then if you go to what's in the solar system, and the biggest thing in the solar system is the sun, which is a hundredth of an AU. I mean, I didn't even work out the number. It's just really small. I think it's in the order of microns, which is how thick a human hair is. So uh, if the entire United States was uh, the Milky Way galaxy, the size of, of a single star is the width of a human hair. And um, yeah, so if I haven't said it enough, um, things are big in space um, for, uh, compared to, to human scale. All right. Let's keep jumping. All right, so we're going to jump again. And now instead of being 50 kiloparsecs across, we're now at 5,000 kiloparsecs, that's thousands of thousands, which would give us millions. And so the unit is now 5 megaparsec, MPC. Megaparsec, uh, remember mega is a million, so 5 million parsecs is this picture. And what you see on the left is what we call the local group of galaxies. That's where we live. It's a poor cluster of galaxies. Uh, we say poor cluster, that's a technical term, actually, poor cluster. And uh, each other dot you see in that picture is a galaxy. And it's about 30 or so galaxies in this, uh, in this group here. And uh, you notice some of those dots are very close together. So um, let's do another scaling question. So it's basically the same question I asked earlier in the lecture. It's um, trying to figure out how far apart uh, galaxies are. So we're going to make the Milky Way galaxy a basketball. And we are going to uh, take another basketball and put it out at some distance so it represents where uh, another galaxy will be located. So think about this question for a minute. But the answer here is A. And you may be surprised at this. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense when you look at the picture. So let's go back to the picture. Um, the picture on the right would be the basketball. And the picture on the left is two orders of magnitude larger, which means you can fit 100 basketballs from left to right. And you notice some of those dots are very close together. In fact, some of those dots are basically right on top of each other. It turns out if you actually do the numbers, uh, the next basketball is only about 10 feet away from you. Now, what this illustrates is that the environment of galaxies and the environment of stars are radically different. Galaxies are not enormously far apart with respect to their distances, uh, so to their sizes at least. In fact, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which I mentioned, is the closest galaxy of significant size, and it's about uh, a little more than 10 times the size of our own galaxy. That's how far away it is. And there are plenty of other galaxies closer, smaller, insignificant things. In fact, the closest galaxy technically to us somewhat overlaps our galaxy. So it'd be like a basketball that's just a foot away from you or so. And um, what that's going to mean, and you'll see this later in the class, is that... Um, the environments of stars and galaxies are radically different, and uh, therefore what they do is radically different. Stars are usually in isolation. They very rarely interact with each other. Even if you take two galaxies and you merge them together, 
you know, that 10 million scale factor I mentioned earlier only goes down by a factor of two. So there's still enormous dis distances between stars. In fact, you merge two galaxies together, you probably won't have a single star collide with another star. For the most part, those things are going to be fine. But because galaxies are so close together, they do interact. In fact, that is very common for galaxies. Interactions between galaxies is a very important part of studying galaxies. In fact, the way a galaxy looks is usually the result of interactions with its neighbors. Um, in fact, you'll see when we get into galaxies, our own galaxy is very disheveled, basically. We have many spiral arms, half of which are broken in half, and it's because of interactions we've had with neighbors and things like that. And that's not how stars are like, but that's how galaxies are like. So, All right, so this is the last jump. Um, we can't jump more than this because that would take us outside of the observable universe. The picture on the left is a computer generated image of what a sort of God's eye view of the universe might look like. If we could see the entire universe in a picture. And it's a little difficult to, to discern what you're looking at in the picture, but the analogy I could give you is imagine you're looking at a dishwashing sponge. From a distance, a dishwashing sponge may look homogeneous. It looks kind of all uniform. But if you zoom in really carefully, you see that there are bubbles of nothingness. We call these things voids. And then there's the structure of the sponge. We call these things filaments and walls. And the filaments and walls are basically super clusters. They're clusters of clusters. For example, the picture on the right is our local group. We're part of a larger cluster called the Virgo supercluster, which is part of a larger group as well. And that's how the universe is sort of structured, clusters of clusters, or we call super clusters. And there's these large voids in between them. And that's kind of what the universe likes, looks like on a larger scale. But on the larger scales, it's for the most part very uniform in its appearance. Uh, the size we have right here is uh, 500 million parsecs, which converts to about 16.3 billion light years. That is a look back time that exceeds the age of the universe. So technically in this picture, there are aspects that are outside of the observable edge, you know, given that our universe is around uh, uh, the latest estimates put it around 13.7 billion years old. So there are aspects of our uh, of our universe that are outside of that distance, and therefore we haven't seen that stuff yet. But that's the biggest we can go here. Uh, the term megaparsec is a unit you will hear, uh, and it's a unit that is used to describe the distance to some uh, nearby, well, really, the distance to any galaxy is, can be specified megaparsecs. It's uh, pretty much the biggest unit that we use in this class here. All right. So um, to kind of end up, uh, to end the video here, there's a few things I want to go over. Um, you saw the idea of scale, very important concept in this class that we'll talk about quite a bit. But there were other uh, uh, purposes for the lecture. Uh, one was units. Um, here is a list of the various units that I've talked about and what their purpose is. And so it's very important to understand the context of the units. Uh, the AU is used for solar systems. Uh, the light year of the parsec is used for nearby stars. Uh, megaparsec or kiloparsec is used for distances within a galaxy and megaparsecs are distances to some nearby galaxies. So when you hear these units, you automatically know the context that we're talking about. We also talked about how to manipulate numbers, scientific notation, things like that. Uh, so this is this this whole lecture is a nice overview of a lot of the ideas that are going to be reoccurring as we move on through this class. I have a couple questions to finish this up. Um, so, in context, the galactic center is located about eight blank away from the Earth. So, what is the right unit to use in context here? So, think about that for a moment. The answer here is C. Okay, so to remi remind you of this, uh, astronomical units would be distances within our, within our solar system. Light years are nearby star distances. Killer parsecs are big distances within a galaxy, and that's why this is the correct unit in context. Megaparsec is a unit we would use to describe things that are outside of our galaxy. Okay, so kiloparsec is the appropriate unit to use in context. Um, the picture you see on the right here is the uh, is, a, is the Hubble Space Telescope image of uh, Eris. Eris um, was discovered in the later 2000s, actually actually mid 2000s, 
I think 2003 actually. Uh, and it actually was the reason why Pluto got demoted. Um, at the time of its discovery, we believed that it was larger, more massive than Pluto. And so the um, group of astronomers that discovered it um, lobbied the International Astronomical Union um, to have it be named the 10th planet. And um, that created a large debate for several years until it was decided in like 2006, I believe, um, that we are going to change uh, the definition of a planet. In fact, not really change. We didn't really have a definition of a planet, to be honest. Um, but uh, we decided that Eris was not a planet, and then now Pluto is not a planet. And so when we get into the solar system stuff in a few weeks, I'll, I'll discuss more about the why Pluto is not a planet anymore. But anyway, for this question here, uh, Eris is located 96 point what? Point, uh, sorry, 96.7 what? Um, what's the distance? The correct answer here would be A. Okay, Eris is in our solar system, so the unit to use would be the AU. Okay, good. All right, so that rounds out the lecture here. Uh, there's another concept that you'll read about in the book. It's called the Cosmic Calendar. It's a very similar thing to what I just did in the video here, except it deals with time. And in fact, um, if you look in the description of the video, I'll actually post a link to another video from uh, the Cosmos series that uh, talks a bit about the cosmic calendar and its significance and how you can relate like human time to the entire span of the universe's time and the Earth's time and things like that. So um, I'll have you watch that video as well. Uh, but that rounds out today.